Trent Dalton, welcome to I Catch Killers. It's an honour to be here, Gary. Love the podcast. Well, you know, I, I first heard you speak, uh, I think you were having a chat with Maddie Johns, and uh, I heard oh. a, a fair bit about your story, and I thought, I've got yeah. to get you on the podcast, so here we are. Well, I was talking to Trish Johns just last night, would you believe, actually? That's a, that's a wild little coincidence, but um, yeah, that, well, you got to understand, Gary, how huge that was to me. I'm a massive league fan, and, um, and to cross the worlds of my two passions, literature and rugby league. Um, that, that Matty Johns interview was um, very special. And it's funny that you saw that one because I hear more about that interview than a lot of things because it's the one where a lot of blokes, uh, you know, they just happen to be watching the football and then they tune into that uh, face-to-face interview that Matty did. And suddenly they're saying, uh, mate, uh, because of that interview, I decided to call my old man and I haven't called him in 30 years, you know, so that the most amazing things can come when, when us fellas start sort of uh, exploring more um, vulnerable things like, uh, you know, uh, literature, the the sort of things we can learn from literature and uh, not just footy sometimes, you know, so it's really, it was really great to mix both those worlds. Yeah, I I think it's a a good thing where they uh, they cross over and uh, people uh, discover, okay, it's all right for uh, two guys to sit down and have have a discussion, actually talk a little bit deeper than we normally do and uh, emotions. I've got another uh, common link, a a good mate of mine, uh, Rob Carlton, and I got to say he's a big fan of yours, uh, Trent and uh, Rob Carlton. Uh, I've mentioned him on the podcast. I did a live tour, uh, tour with him around the uh, around the country. Wow! And he speaks so highly of you. I think you might. Uh, I think he's got a crush on you, actually. Trent. So <laughs> you might have to take well, a restraining order out here. No, it's a real um, it's a real bro relationship that one. It's really blossomed too because um, that extraordinary man. I got a call out of the blue, Gary and. Uh, you know, Rob Carlton is a guy I've watched. We we actually did some. Uh, I I had a short film in the same um, Tropfest competition that he had an extraordinary short film called Carmichael and Shane, which I, was all about. Yeah. You know all about Carmichael yeah. and Shane. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. It, it's um it's just the best because it's all about these twi- you know these these two brothers these twin boys and one one Carmichael gets all the sort of love from the dad and I think it's Shane is the other kid and and he gets not much love at all and. Uh, and he sort of owns it. And I think Rob won that year and uh, we came about third, I think that year, but it's when I first sort of loved that dude. And then, um, yeah. And out of the blue, uh, he gives me a call because he's playing Brian, Brian Robertson, the, the editor in um, the boy swallows universe adaptation of my debut novel, boy swallows universe. And, and I'm just at home in the sort of suburbs of Brisbane and this extraordinary comic, this amazing actor gives me a call and he wants to unpack everything in my head like just to just to research like this character he's playing and we just had the most amazing chats and he wanted to know where my journalism was all coming from and he put so much work into it and um and just really cared about it gary like i got so much time for that guy because he knew that that story was so deep to me and it's like mate i was put on this planet to write that book boy swallows universe and 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 rob really knew that you know and and he sort of took this big responsibility of um playing this guy Brian Robertson, who's the perfect amalgam of like every editor I ever had on a newspaper, and he's just nailed it, mate. He just um, yeah. smashed it. He's uh, he's an impressive person. We go back uh, twenty years. We used to uh, train together and uh, just formed a bond from there. But uh, last, so, uh, sorry. Yep. So you're in the you're in the cops, right? And then he's acting like that must have been a great couple of conversations you guys are having. It was like... the it was the strangest group of training partners you'd ever get. There was a <laughs> uh, one other uh, one other cop, a special forces guy, and Rob the actor. And uh, oh, that's we. <laughs> that's great. So you could, you can't make this shit up. We uh, we it. it was on the central coast, and that's sort of where where we became friends. And. Uh, but Rob would turn up and the special forces guy, you didn't want to mess with him. And we just sort of fall in behind him and, you know, he'd have us running up hills and doing crazy stuff. And Rob might make the comment, Hey, uh, buddy, you're looking a bit uh, tubby at the moment, like pissing the guy off. And oh, I, I'd be going, Oh, that's, that's really good, Rob. Thank you. For yeah, that. that's and great. Then, that's, then, that's then, like five, five more hills, five more hills. Thanks buddy. Yeah. 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 And then we'd get smashed. But I, uh, last year, um, two of the country with him, with uh, I catch killers live show. And, uh, I've got to say, he taught me so much about live theatre, and mm. I was like a deer in the spotlight, actually, you know, a show. And he yeah. said, uh, I thought it might be a Q&A type scenario, you know, playing at Enmore Theatre. That was our opening show. It packed out Enmore Theatre on a Saturday, a Saturday night. That's wild. Yeah, that's... I 
and it was during the COVID time. We'd just come out of that. The planets aligned, and it was two weeks out, and they said, right, you're, you're right to go, and we said, yeah. And uh, I thought it would be Q&A, and Rob goes, no, stupid, this is the theatre. We're going to take the audience on a journey. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I'm, I've got this monologue to learn and, you know, all this stuff that uh, just took me out of my comfort zone. But I was like a sponge with Rob on yeah. how to interact with the audience and, and lessons that we learnt. i got to say, travelling around the country driving with him, because we did a lot, of, a lot of driving together, sometimes I wanted to throw him out of the car because he's just got so much energy. <laughs> Uh, it's, he, he so does. I actually caught his one man show. Um, and I, I'll, I'll, I'll make it yeah. relevant. I won't just make it about Rob this up, but it's like what Rob did. He's this one man show and they're just stories from his life and he makes them so funny. It's just him, a stool. And, it, and he takes you into the world. He has this one story he tells on this one man show about carrying around. I believe it's his father's ashes and he doesn't know what to do with this urn or this box. I think he's just got this box. And mate, like I lost my old man and, you know, and it's just like, I was weeping, you know, this guy, Rob Carlton, like the ability, I admire anyone who can turn uh, the darkness into light in the form of uh, uh, inspiration, but even more powerful is turning darkness into comedy. And it's yeah. like, that's a gift, mate. And I was like, yeah, I learned so much from that guy too. And But I tell you, Gary, what I, I get impressed with you, mate, in terms of that, you know, when you say you're a sponge and stuff, because I... I don't know if you remember this. You helped me out on a yarn once that I was doing with your friend, Dan Box, and I'd right. never forget it. You gave me the time of day, and it was really sweet. And I and um, you were very busy at that time, you know, working yeah, on, yeah. you know, one of the biggest cases Australia's ever faced. And and uh, and I never forget you just taking the time and being so kind and eloquent. And I was just such a numbskull, you know. I didn't know the operations of police work yeah. at all, and you were so kind to me. And uh, but But I've just really enjoyed the way... I find it very inspiring how you have it, you you make me believe you, that a, that a human being in a lifetime can do many bloody things, right? Like I, I just love that, you know. That like look at their stuff. You, you you're at the Airmore Theatre with Rob. What it's like? What the hell? You know, like I find that really inspiring. Oh, well, thank thanks, Trent. I I appreciate it. It has been a journey, but uh, look. Looking at your journey, I've uh, yeah, I've, I found that fascinating when you were speaking to uh, uh, Maddie Johns and, and just mm. your upbringing and your life and uh, and your books that you've read. It's given me a real um, snippets from the book is detail. It's detail that you've have to have lived the life or you wouldn't understand what it's there. Now, from a cop point yeah. of view, I'm looking at it and going, yeah, this bloke knows knows this, oh. this world. Oh wow, yeah. Is that um, yeah. And what I, I find from your understanding of the world, and this is what I think is is really interesting, that uh, and a forensic psychologist, Dr. Sarah Yule, who I worked with for a long time in uh, in homicide, she would always be at pains to point out to me just because someone does a bad thing doesn't necessarily make them a bad person, and mm. you know it is so true. It is so true, and I've discovered that since I've left the uh, left the cops. And I speak to people that were, yeah, the reputation as notorious criminals. Sit down and find out a little bit about them. And, uh, okay, I understand the path that they've, they've gone on. What's your thoughts on, uh, yeah, just because someone does a bad thing, there's not necessarily a bad person? Um, Gary, I'm getting chills just the way you've described that. Um, it's it's everything, mate. I think I, I hope to be writing about that very topic maybe for the rest of my life. I mean... I got into journalism 23 years ago and about five years into that career, I started just writing all these stories where I'd interview criminals and, and just try and be so balanced about it and, 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 re and remove my, my personal opinions on the horrendous crime and just try and work out um, the journey that that person takes to that crime. And um, it was just weird. It was very strange that I would just, I did a lot of stories, like that like like and it to the point where it got to it got too um it got too much i once interviewed a uh a child pornographer it got really yeah. freaking dark like um and my wife was like nah this guy doesn't she's like you've gone too far there like he doesn't deserve your sympathy and yeah. and i think what i was doing gary was just trying to work out my own stuff from my own childhood and you know so so what you said like mate for me that begins at my first memory that notion of what you're talking about my first memory is we're in this house. Um, I, I've got three older brothers and, 
and uh so it goes you know yeah older yeah so i'm the youngest of of four boys and uh and i'm like i must be four three or four years of age it's my absolute earliest memory and i'm i'm sitting on a brown leather couch um in a in a it's a ratty home on the outside but on the inside we've got all these lovely furnishings and i don't know why we're kind of seemingly wealthy in this shitty neighborhood and uh and I turn to my left and I see this guy with red hair. He looks like John Lennon circa the help album. And, uh, and I dead set Gary, I turned to this guy and I said, I love you dad. And, um, and this guy ruffles my hair really sweetly. This guy's covered in tats and he's wearing a Jackie house singlet and thongs. And he says, I love you too, mate, but I'm not your dad. Yeah. And I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> like what? What's that about? This and, is, uh, this is confusing but, for a four year old. Yeah. Really, really just really, jarring and and i think i i think the i think the reason that memory stayed is because it was so groundbreaking like it was like mm. that doesn't make sense and uh and of course later on you know as the years uh went by i realized that guy was was at once the first man i ever loved in my life and mm. care about very much to this day um but he was a really dangerously successful heroin dealer and uh and then when I'm like seven, my older brothers tap me on the shoulder and we crawl into that guy's bedroom and, and we go to his uh, built-in wardrobe and, and my brother finds a secret sort of, I swear, Gary, this sounds ridiculous, but yeah. um, it's true. He found a little hole in the, I'm, well, actually, I'm I'm talking to you, I'm sure you've seen stuff yeah, like yeah, this, mate. I, I, I right, know right. from the book and I'm thinking, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that sounds believable. Yeah. Well, it's all, it's all, so then my oldest brother, Joel, um, removes this piece of wood a wood panel in in this guy's built-in wardrobe and then he's he slides feet first into a chasm and just disappears and it was just the most groundbreaking kind of moment of my youth you know and i was sort of like i started realizing that there are many things that the adults aren't telling us and uh and 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 then you know so my next brother jesse and then there goes ben we peek our heads into that room and and Joel's just standing there going, can you believe this standing inside this, essentially a room that's built built in under this guy's bedroom. And um, there's nothing in that room, but a telephone or a red telephone. And uh, anyway, so then cut to like, I'm 17 and having beers with those brothers and going like, do you guys remember the the room underneath? Uh, I'll call him. I don't, I don't use this guy's name out of, yeah. out of just sort of care for this yeah. guy. He's still like, we still talk on the phone and it's like, he's kind of, he's done his time big time that guy. And, uh, but, um, anyway, I'll call him Lyle and, uh, cause that's the character in Boyce Waller's universe that I kind of based on this guy. And, uh, and I'm like, do you remember that room under Lyle's house? And Joel's like, yeah, man, that's where they, um, that's where he would go if he was ever in a jam and the police were coming and stuff. And then also they'd like pack drugs in there and stuff. And, um, and that just really blew my mind. But, but what I want to say about where you're going with that is that guy, got put away for 10 years, you know, you know, rightly so. I'm not, I don't want to ever um, glamorize any of that stuff or make it out like, you know, it's sort of at all romantic at all that world. But, but mate, that guy went away. And then for the rest of my teens, I, I, I dreamed of that guy turning up on my doorstep out at, out at uh, housing commission Brackenridge, you well, know, I, and I, just. I suppose at that age, Trent, you, you're looking for someone that will show you a little bit of love. You're looking at someone that you can look up to, aspire to. What what role models have you got? So I understand that, uh, okay, well, he he's, seems to be the man of the house and uh, yeah. you're not going to judge him morally if he's dealing drugs because you don't know, don't know any better. This, this is the thing. And I, I wanted to, yeah, mate, there's a lot of Aussie kids out there, mate, as you know, you know, there's just so many Aussie kids in that kind of world and, and I, I, I try and I tried to say with that book, Boy Swallows Universe, like, um, don't, don't write off these dads that are in your life, you know, g like give them their time for redemption, you know, give them the time to redeem themselves. Like, don't be quick to, I don't know, like, you know, but I don't want to say that, like, I don't want it at all, like, um, make anyone sort of permit horrendous behavior by yeah. us sort of dads in the world, but it's like, there is a case to be made that that uh, that not writing off 
well, not writing off those blokes in my life has been extremely fulfilling to me. You know what I mean? Like I could have right. gone one way and just gone, I'm done. But mate, that's where I found all the love in the world. And that's, I'm absolutely here talking to you, Gary, because of those men, you know? I, and, I very um, much understand that, that Trent, what you, you're saying there. And it's part of uh, why it really resonates with, with myself. Cause I've been out of the police now three or four years and uh, mm. I've, I've, through the podcast and other things I'm doing, I've been exposed to a lot of people. And some of these people, and they're not putting it lightly here, if we came across each other when we were working, we'd probably draw guns and, you know, someone... Wow. You know, they were hard dudes. But when yeah, I of sit, course. sit down and talk to them, I'm thinking, okay, well, if I went through that path, I can understand living that life. And... It's really hard because you, you don't want to, and I, I'm in that position like people think, well, what's this hard-ass cop gone soft now and that everyone's fine, you know, lovey-dovey. No, but I think there's an important point that we've got to understand that everything's not black and white in the world of crime, and that's a, the world I understand, and, and your books have taken me back into that in a fictional, mm. but also a factual way because they're very relatable characters, and... Uh, yeah, I've met some people that have done horrendous crimes, organised crime people, but if you told their family that, they wouldn't believe it because they're very loving. They care for their children, they love their wife and all that, but then they go out and do do what they do, and, uh, yeah, it's a terrible thing. So, oh, mate, I mean, I, 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 I wish the... um, Sometimes I wish the judicial system kind of, I don't know, sort of explored that, what you're talking about a bit more. Yeah. And I, I, I said this ridiculous... I was at this... Uh, uh, it was a conference for uh, the Youth Advocacy Centre in, um, in Brisbane, an amazing place that helps kids who have kind of confronting the law and and uh, and have to get some assistance, but also, you know, they, they might be seeking help through housing or all sorts of stuff, and they get these amazing lawyers who help them out, and they all come together and kind of give them guidance and stuff. And someone in the audience said, uh, Trent, uh, like, Trent Dalton, how would you solve youth crime and i'm like you know it's i could tell you a hundred things about that but what i said was um like just remember um what those kids let's say large largely young men like you know 15 16 year old boys at least in brisbane there's a lot of lot of youth crime up here with a lot of a lot of boys just going through a lot of stuff and i'm just like i just remember what that was like gary like being that age and being really angry at the world uh, looking in the mirror and kind of saying three words, which are like, fuck them all. Yeah. Um, and, and not caring about any consequences. And I'm just always trying to say like, please try and understand that boy's story. And, and, and if you understand their story and if you understand what they're looking at in the mirror, then that's the way we're going to help them change what they see in the mirror. And that's how we might just solve this sort of this stuff. But I mean, that's so complex, but it's like, and then I said, this dorky thing was like, and, and but no one laughed it was really sweet and there was a room full of judges and lawyers and stuff and i was just like there is never any room for for the lack of love in in um courtrooms like no yeah. no one talks no one talks about how do we keep the love factor inside a like let's say when they're sentencing a father or um sentencing a mum and about to put her in prison like they never talk about the love that's going to be removed from the 15 year old boy. And it's like, I just said, I, I would love a world where, you know, we get to look at, I don't know. I mean, it's so cheesy me even dropping the word love inside a courtroom type scenario, but it's yeah. like, sometimes it's like worth actually thinking about. You know? oh, mo most definitely. And yeah, you've got to break it down. Like the, the law, the, uh, the crime we're talking about when people go off, off track, there's usually a reason there. And I, 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 yeah. I put it to, let, let's say, the bikies. We all know the bikies. They get round, they, they, yeah, they're muscled up, covered in tattoos, and yeah, they, they look fearless. They're together. Quite often when you step away from that, where that's emanated from is that they've been scared as a child. They haven't had the oh. love. They haven't had that support, and they're looking for that. And they're, they're, they never want to be a victim again because they've seen the world just turn on them, and that's how they, they end up there. Uh, Gary, I'll, I'll give two examples from Boy Swallows Universe. So, so there's Lyle, who's that guy that I'm telling you about with the red hair that I really care about to this day, and there's Slim Halliday. So, Slim Halliday is this notorious uh, Brisbane criminal, Queensland kind of, you know, criminal kind of legend back in the '50s. Like he he escaped the inescapable Bogger Road prison twice. Um, he potentially got fitted up for a job uh, for a murder that he 
maintained all through his life that he didn't do. I'm not going to call it either way out of yeah. respect for the victim's family, but but Slim did 30 years inside Bogo Bogo Road, right? Um, and then so so Lyle and Slim, and then the Dalton boys, right? And you look at the like there was some time. Uh, I don't know. I just feel really lucky that the Dalton boys didn't go down that way. But the difference is Lyle. Um, he was raised by a woman who uh, just didn't wasn't equipped to raise him. He 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 had a a uh, a neighbor look after him who was a prostitute, and he basically, as a baby, was one of those like a drawer baby, like a chest of drawers. Yeah. That was his crib. Um, gets out of that situation, falls n- no guidance whatsoever, falls immediately into crime, goes to Westbrook, like basically the breeding ground of every 1970s criminal you ever saw in Queensland, um, this Westbrook home for boys. Yeah. And um, Slim Halliday, um, go, go uh, abandoned as a, as a boy, um, goes to the Carlingford Boys Home in northern New South Wales, just where horrendous things happened. Yeah. Uh, he gets out of that situation, um, robs his way up the the coast of Australia just to uh, to make to eat, you know. And it's like that's how I don't know. Like it's just like it's kind of obvious in the difference between those fellas. And not like the Dalton yeah. boys were anywhere near that, but it's like, mate, we had just we had we had love, you know. We had we had people who gave a shit but about us. You know, I I really get what you're saying and uh you, you're talking about slim there's a person that came into my life after i left the cops bernie matthews was his name oh uh, it's, uh, you, I, you, you, I know that name yeah yeah you've probably yeah. heard of him but uh for people that haven't i've talked about him a lot on the the podcast had him on the podcast had an amazing uh, amazing story he uh he'd been in prison as long as i'd been in the cops for over 30 years he escaped wow. from long bay he was an armed robber he was the longest serving prisoner in uh, Katingle, which was the first Supermax, and he was also um, up in Grafton, where there was a Royal Commission into uh, into what occurred at Grafton, and there was that was for the intractable prisoners. So they, the ones that they couldn't control in the standard prisons, they'd get the Grafton, and there was the Grafton Biff, and yeah, it was a brutal, brutal place. Bernie sat down with me and uh, said, you know. And he he's passed away now, sadly. But I, I would visit him in hospital, and uh, he would say, "Yeah, looking back, and I think he wanted to get his uh, get a story out, not just his story. He'd been an award winning journalist as well when he was mm. in between uh, stints in in jail. Really, uh, that's incredible. Uh, yeah, uh, just an incredible person. And he said, "If you treat us like animals, we're going to come out like animals." And he said his observations of what was in Grafton, people that would get sent there that weren't violent they would have to be violent to survive and they'd come out violent. And it really got me to thinking about the whole whole process of what, what is justice. Is it, um, And the more inmates I speak to, it's the punishment is we've been taken away from our loved ones. We've been taken away from society. That's the punishment. We don't need to be punished inside. Now, people might jump up and down and go, uh, yeah, that, that's not right. It's if, you, if you've done the crime, you should be in jail breaking rocks. But what's that achieved? Gary, mate, you're going to get me emotional because you're going to make me think about my mum. And mate, you want to <laughs> you want to you want to punish that woman? Yeah. Friggin' stop, take her away from her four sons, you know. And I, I, I really feel for. I I think about this most when you see mums get put away. And yeah. like, I would really love some. You know, there's a lot of few people ad- advocates up here, and I don't want to sort of you know be like bashing things over people's heads or anything. But it's like we've got to really address that whole sort of um, just how, how hard uh, um, I talk about it a little bit in slim kind of says it to Eli in my yeah. book, boy swallows universe, where it's like, you, I, I would imagine your mum's, you know, two or three years that she's going to do is harder than my 30 years because she's yeah. just a mum who's got four sons and slim didn't have four sons, you know? And it's like, mate, like that it, without a doubt would have been the thing in my mum's life when, you know, she sort of went down with um, this guy I'm telling you about, yeah. and not not um, not as long, thankfully. So, Trent, when your your mother was in prison, what what was it for? Well, she just got caught up with this man she loved, and she she got done in a um, I think it was in a club, like 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 dealing. She was she was um, right. she was she got done for trafficking, and and uh, and that's the thing. It's just like, mate, she's just swept up in it, and you know, she was um, she was I I believe like you know she was on the stuff at the time. Yeah. And, and, and that's just, 
I, I like to stress when I even talk about it is that that's a whole world of shit that leads her to that place, you know, and and um yeah, so that's and then that sets off, you know, absolutely the the hardest period of her life, and and um thank God she kind of got out got out of it, and so you you can imagine the kind of um oh man by the time but from where she was before going in and to the woman that came out um it was yeah. kind of beautiful to see as a kid actually in many ways to see the woman she then became you could sort of cut her life in half at that point yep and and kind of see where she went from there and um and it kind of all starts with that weird time yeah, yeah. i had a i had a dear friend i grew up in high school with um really close like she was the girl everyone loved and uh and she was um Anyway, I won't go into specifics, but she was got done trafficking ice, yep. and um, and this judge and I wrote a letter to this judge, um, because he was so clear headed with his ability to see that she was gonna sort her shit out, because yep. she had like in between um charge and sentencing, she really had Gary and like and 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 for some reason he 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 did not make her go to prison. Like he, he saved yeah. her from prison. He said, look, listen, I don't know why I'm doing this. I hope you bloody, you know, like, I hope you pay me my faith back. And she has paid him back in spades. Like she is just the best mom. And you know what I mean? Like, it's just like, and we were, we were all just praying that she wouldn't go to prison. Cause I know personally, yeah. mate, like that's done for those kids. You know what I mean? You take a mum, and these kids of hers were super brilliant athletes and like these amazing sports women. And I just think that, all of that would have been done if they lost their mum. You know what I mean? Well, like, isn't that 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 restores my faith in part with the courts that they can recognise that because that's what they've got to look at. If if they think of everyone as a number and that we've got it wrong, I I cringe when I hear the mandatory sentencing coming in. So anyone that's committed yeah. this offence, we're going to put them away for that. It yes, does, it, it's it just does not work. You've got to look at each case individually. Oh, because where does that take in coercive control? Where does that take in things like, well, you know, what is that particularly a woman, a situation yeah. if she's got a, got herself in? Like, I bet there's some stuff in there where she's in a hell of a shitty situation, just like my mum was in many ways. Like she, you know, she she met and fell in love with that guy because she was escaping one other thing, you know? So it's sort of, it's all these, yeah, you've got to understand why someone is might be finding themselves in that world yeah but sorry mate i didn't mean to get on sort of any sort of um you know but it's i love that you're talking about it gary because i it's a fascinating thing and it all stems from that thing about having not it's just trying to see um i just believe all humans which is why i love your podcast it's all about just getting up a bit closer and it's hard to hate someone if you're close if you move closer you know it's really yeah i've got the i've been working on a project i think i I can mention it's coming out uh soon but uh i've been going into uh, maximum security prisons and uh, spending a lot of time and having free reign around the uh, around the prisons and uh, wow. speaking to uh, speaking to people in there and it's been an eye opener in so many different ways so many different ways and and it gave me the opportunity to sit down and speak to people inside and seriously some people if I had the uh, and I, I'm not naive you know, like I was a cop for over 30 <laughs> years I'm not naive. <laughs> But there's some people, and uh, there was one particular person that uh, sat down, and he got caught up in drugs, started dealing drugs and, and doing time away from his kids. And uh, he said, look, I had a business. I went down a path that, the you know, stupid, for whatever reason, I have learnt my lesson, but I've still got another six years to serve or, or whatever. He'd been in there for a couple of years. He said, I can guarantee the moment I walk out this door, I'm not going to do another thing wrong. I don't want this life. And he was genuine. I, I, I reckon I can judge when there's bullshit coming or whatever. So genuine. I think, what are we achieving? What are we achieving keeping him in? He's got uh, kids that, uh, you yeah, oh. know, miss him dearly. I got to speak to the kids on the outside. And, oh, Gary, yeah. this sounds amazing. This sounds really important what you're doing. Like speaking to the kids as well. That's that's incredible. Yeah. And it, it just it sort of really opened, opened my eyes. Opened my eyes up to a, a different way of dealing, dealing with things. And the recidivism. Uh, rates are ridiculous in this country. We send people to prison and mm. uh, invariably they end up back in prison. So we've got to break that cycle in in some way. But I think just talking emotionally about it, like, yeah, two blokes talking about it, because yeah. why not yeah. back to your story? I, 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 I've asked this because I, I've sat here opposite a lot of people that have similar type uh, upbringings to you and they've gone down a path that they've woken up to themselves 30 years down the track after they've done a lot of time in prison. 
what do you think it was that stopped you going down that uh, going down that path? Like it would have been easy for you to uh, just rebel and yeah, and end up inside yourself. Um, several people, but I'll tell you one is a guy named Joel Dalton. He's my um he's my oldest brother, and uh, you know so. So I, I was about six and seven when the real heavy stuff was going on for us boys. And I, and like the kid in the kid, Eli Bell in the book is more Joel's age. Like it's like, so I transferred sort of things in almost made him kind of Joel's Joel and Ben's age, my two older brothers. And, and, you know, those boys just carried a lot, Gary, like really, really, you know, you're just older and wiser and, you know, that book's written Joel read my book and just said, oh, it's so funny how you saw it that way. Like he's yeah. like, you saw it with these sort of, it's not rose colored, but it, like, I just saw it through wonder. I, yeah. I saw all the childlike, the, childlike imagination, the childlike, yeah. childlike imagination. Yeah. That's it. And that's my coping mechanism. You know, it's better than friggin' smashing down bourbon, but, um, but, but, um, that guy, Joel, and I, I have no idea why Gary, but he just, he just said like, boys, like, this is not for us, bros. Like this is, this is not going to be our world. And, yeah. and I remember, I remember once even I was like 13 and I told my brother, I'd, uh, I was bragging about how I, you know, I jumped a train all the way to, you know, from, from Brackenridge to, to the city and back. And I'm like, didn't pay a cent, Joel. And he's like, no, oh, that's fucking bullshit. Because, because what happens from there, Trent next, what are you going to do next? You know, what shortcut are you going to take now? Like he's sort of saying, I'm not that impressed. Like, and, and that was, that was always his way. Like he was always like, don't be a dickhead. Like if, if I like, it's like serious Gary, like if, if, if I see you friggin' waste your life, Trent, you know, it's coming from my bro, man. Yeah. Like, like I get, I get, I just, just the things he told me and the examples he set was just like, he's like, you can, you can read or you, he's like, Trent, I've seen you write the most amazing English essays. And it's like, if you waste that stuff, like I am going to kick your ass. Like I am going to, you know, and it's yeah. like, that was the tone. It was the tone he set. And then he, you know, he got himself out of housing commission Brackenridge. He joined the army, you know, became a major in the army and just incredibly inspiring, you know, that a Dalton boy would sort of be called major Dalton, you know, that yeah, shit was yeah. massive Gary. Like that was, that was huge to me. And I was like 18 by then. And I'm like, damn it. Maybe I can do something too. Like I, Sorry, I get, I get like, you ask me what it is. It's really him. And then Ben had, you know, Joel set the example for Ben and Ben set the example for Jesse, the next one down. And then, so I'm just soaking all that stuff up. And, and then by the time all that stuff was going down, we also had this, um, it's really, you know, slightly troubled and deeply complex man named Noel, who was, um, we went to live over at Brackenridge once everything went down with mum and this guy, um, you know, we go over to Northside Brisbane and, you know, suddenly we're being raised by this guy who's like a massive drinker, but he's just this incredible reader and he does nothing but read books all day. Um, just constantly saying also, um, if you follow my footsteps, I will kick your ass. Like, yeah. it's like, it's like, it's just like, please do not look at this world um, and, and, and believe for a second that it's the way to go, you but know? The, and Trent, um, I, I think in the, in your response to the question, you, you've answered it so clearly. And uh, I, I see it so many times. One person can make such a difference in someone's uh, life time and time again. And invariably people that are on the wrong side, as in behind the still gates in, uh, in prison, just haven't had that one person to steer them in the right direction. And what a difference that can make. Mentor Mate, you, and yeah, friendship and love and all, all that sort of stuff that you need. There is sometimes an invisible wall, um, particularly out in the suburbs. If you're in those sort of areas, like up in Brisbane, Brackenridge is pretty okay these days, yeah. but it's now like areas like Logan and there's an invisible wall for those young people out there, you know, sometimes. And, 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 and you need someone, you don't even know it's there, but cause you just, and what that invisible wall is doing is sh is keeping you away from the things that life is is potentially offering you, and you just you just have no idea that you're allowed to have those things too. And uh, you need someone, for whatever reason. I had Joel who just went, mate. There's no wall. Let's go. I'm gonna I'm gonna play a guitar in a band. I'm gonna listen to the Cure, but I'm also gonna join the army and I'm I'm gonna play league and I'm gonna do all these things in life. I'm gonna meet a girl. I'm gonna have kids. I'm gonna do it all. And it's like. Thanks, man. Thanks for setting the example. I don't know. 
Uh, you got to, and you got to take your examples wherever you can get them. Yeah. That's why I urge people to do always. It's just like look at someone and just go, "Yep, yeah, I'll follow that." Yeah, that that seems to be the right path. Journalism. What took you into uh, journalism? Um, only ever good at English at school, Gary. Like yeah. just uh, had a teacher. Um, I remember distinctly we did a magazine sort of assignment at school, and I was. I spent most of my childhood sort of at school just dreaming and, it, you know, in, in many ways school was just like actually a sort of a place to kind of process the shit you saw last night kind yeah, of thing. Okay, but um, yeah, sometimes a bit like that. And so you're not the most diligent student, but one thing I love was English and uh, and only thing I've ever been able to do in life is string words together. Like I, I can't pitch a tent. I, I mean, I can, but it takes forever and uh, um, I can't work on my car. I can't freaking I can't change the oil. I'm just so embarrassed about all the crap I can't do. And I see my friends do and I go around my mate's house to, you know, get him to help me build a dog fence. You know, it's so embarrassing, but, but I, I, I can string sentences together. And, um, and so, and then mate, I was, um, I was dead set. I was probably like 15 and, uh, um, life's just pretty crap and and i was reading a um a rolling stone magazine about my favorite band pearl jam and um and uh there's an article by the now amazing director cameron crow um on pearl jam and and the whole thing opened where he's uh he's sitting on, on a basketball court with like my absolute hero eddie yeah. vetter and uh i'm like damn how did, like that's a job like it's it's someone's you get paid to like go around in Seattle with like Pearl Jam. Like that's a job. And that really appealed to me. And yeah. And so I, I did a, got a really crap um finishing score at year 12. And then, but I managed to get into this one university course at a university in Toowoomba and, uh, and then uh, yeah, jagged a journalism thing. And then just got, um you know, if, and again, you know, you got to always remember the people in your life. So I had this one tutor named Chris Olson, who's a, brilliant Brisbane writer in her, in her own right. And uh, she sort of slapped me around the head with a cold fish one day, Gary, and just said, um, like, you were meant to be a magazine journalist. And it was it was so amazing to have someone just go, um, like, yeah, this is what you're meant to do. And anyway, did, never finished my degree, got a job on this thing called the Brisbane News, which led to my jobs on the Courier Mail. And, and I was off, mate. And I just brought every, um, what I started to realize is, not only do you get paid to do the sort of sit down with Eddie Vedder type stuff, what I started to realize, like more importantly is um, I got to go into living rooms across the Australian suburbs and yeah. sit with people for four hours and, and they would tell me about their shit and that would help me work out my own shit. And it became very powerful, Gary, like it became, um, it became the most important job in the world and, and the greatest cathartic kind of 23 year, um, psychological catharsis yeah it was yeah, I, um, I understand because the, the nature of the type of journalism that you were doing you, you'd be speaking to people from all all levels of society and all different yeah. stories and you know some that uh yeah make yours look like a uh yeah holiday camp and then others yeah all relative isn't it what, that's uh, exactly right you get you, that's so true and you go out and you go ah oh, stop your sobbing mate you know it's like it, for me you know what i mean it's like like i'm you know you know, I have this sort of, you know, abiding memory of like just being really sad and missing, missing mum yeah. when I was like eight years old. It's a very profound kind of powerful thing. And I wrote from that space, like I wrote from that feeling to write Boyce Willis, you know, because it's a beautiful feeling. I don't, I don't, I don't regret that feeling one bit, Gary. Like it's a beautiful feeling. I have it still. And I, and I've, and I really love the kid who's, if that makes any sense, I love the kid in the past who's feeling that. But then you go out, mate, and you're like, you're, you're seeing a kid who's lost both of his parents. You're seeing a kid who's been dragged from pillar to post across every child protection scenario you could name. And you're just going, all right, man, it's, yeah. You know, and you see, you're seeing the strength that that kid's bringing, like these Aussie kids who just are processing their trauma and freaking laughing about it and then yeah. going out the backyard and kicking a football. And it's like, man, okay. You, yeah, can, you, can, learn, you can learn a lot from... Uh from people in those env environments. So oh, I think they, so got much. A, a greater understanding in their own way of uh, what uh, what the important things are in life. So we'll much. Move, we'll move on from your journalism, but I just want to say, you, you, you're, uh, your teacher was quite right. You can write because you've won uh, two Walkley Awards, uh, <laughs> three times Kennedy uh, Award for Excellence in New South Wales Journalism, four times winner of the National News Award Features Journalist of the Year. 
Jesus. Okay. <laughs> oh, oh, you're lovely. Thanks, Gary. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I know you're not going to say it, but it, uh, yeah, there are a lot of uh, prestigious awards there. So you, you must have been doing something right and uh, respected within the industry too, which is always important, isn't it? Oh, mate, I, I think the thing I had in my favour was, and I never realised it, I think people, I think what helped, like it's, you know how, I just I just really think all, all that stuff that I went on later to talk about, which I was so terrified yeah. of talking about, weirdly, just, just didn't, kind of didn't own it, just shoveled it down in the belly of my stomach. And But uh, I think people would let, I think people saw that somehow, you know, like whenever yeah. I'd interview these people and it helped, it just helped me get sometimes it helped my understanding of whatever world they were in. I just had known some parts of it and that, and that really transferred into some of those, all of those articles that all those awards were yeah. all written, you know, all, I got all those awards that you're talking about for, it was all, it was all domestic violence. It was, um, it was crime. It was loss. It was grief. It was people going to prison, like yeah. all the shit all the shit that I've sort of had experience as a boy, you know? And so it's like, it's for me, it's just, it's all this sort of, it's, it's that great thing of something good coming out of like some of that stuff. And it was like, yeah. I I think also Trent, that uh, part of the fact is that you've got empathy, you understand people and uh, yeah, whether Uh, it's journalism or, or policing, like, the good police that I saw had genuine empathy and people would, um, you know, tell the stories and not withhold. They, they'd feel confident that uh, they're not being judged or that they're not being looked at in any way. They they feel comfortable to tell their story. And I'm sure that's something that you uh, projected when you were doing your job as a journalist. Oh, that, that word's so important. I think that's everything. Oh, there's there's two E words, e, two E words in journalism, and I bet you they're the same in detective work. Um, I'd imagine empathy and enthusiasm. I think yeah. enthusiasm is so underrated, and I remember the way you approach your work with such enthusiasm, yeah. Gary. Like in terms of just dogged diligence, you know, and and like that. That's it. By the time I got into journalism, I was just I was a puppy dog, mate. I, I would take on any anything the editors gave me or any any yeah. tasks too wild or anything and just like because you just you just really appreciate um where you're at and uh the chance you've got and i just tell anyone in the world i say it all the time now please be enthusiastic like be just yeah. bring your enthusiasm to your 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 wife bring it to your best mate bring it to the footy game you're watching bring it to the beatles that you're listening on the radio bring it to the bird that you're seeing in the sky and you live a really friggin' rich life that way. You know, it's like, because you're not being cynical and you just, it, it yeah. just, just helps a lot. And well, so I, I'd... I, the word enthusiasm, I, I sort of substitute that for, for passion, which oh, they're basically absolutely. The, 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 the same thing. But, mm. um, with the empathy, when I sit down and speak to, uh, detectives, like highly regarded detectives that I looked up to and everyone looked up to, and I'd ask them and I, I believe they're 100% right. What sort of trait do you want from a detective? And uh, they, the word empathy comes out. Oh, like, really? Uh, Brilliant. So, and I think that separates. If you if you haven't got that, it's uh, you're not going to get people to open up and uh, and talk to you. Isn't it amazing? Because I bet you so many people would probably think, oh, strength or um, yeah. intimidation or uh, you know, it's amazing that it's the flip side. It's yeah. empathy, and it always is the way. Yeah, I never got anything by um, by being some hard ass dickhead at, at someone's front door and sort of demanding entry you know it yeah. always was no I, I remember just you know absolutely cold knocking on a you know pretty famous person who just got done by um for just uh you know dealing in speed and all sorts and, and i just it was just it was all empathy that got me through the door it was just going hey what a you know um yeah. i know i'm the last person you want to see but you know I just want you to know, I freaking know exactly what you're going through. Um, and I, I, th- I even know why you, you, you're there and, and, and listen, I, I'm, I've just got two ears and I will say nothing if you just want to tell me how you're feeling for the next four hours. And I don't know, you can just get, yeah. you can go a long way sometimes just that type of, as opposed to, uh, uh, you did this and the world needs to hear, you know, yeah, <laughs> like that official, type of approach. The, you know? the officious, we're going to get this, we're going to get that, what we want and talk over the top. Yeah. I totally. Understand. Yeah. Okay. Um, Boy Swallows Universe. Well, <laughs> hasn't that been successful? 
Um, oh, thanks, Gary. Yeah. What? Uh, what in? I've got a couple of questions about it. Mm. Um, did you ever consider writing it as a memoir rather than uh, a, a, a fact and fiction sort of overlay? Was it? Did mm. that ever cross your mind? It did. It did. And even just as a journo, like um, too many wild things would happen where, um, you know, really interesting things happened in the newsrooms I'd work in where people would come in. I remember names being shouted across the newsroom and they were names that I knew from as a kid, you know, like, um, we need to find the family of this such and such criminal. And I'm, and I'm like sinking into my chair, just going, holy shit, that's really funny because I played with that guy's kids when I was, oh, I'm you know, such and such. <laughs> yeah, it's that type of stuff. And I was like, God, that would actually read really well in a memoir or something. But in truth, the problem with that, Gary, it, it was no story to it. The, it, it. Basically, the end of that story is um, Trent, Trent meets uh, Fiona, who's my my wife, yep. and he just leads a really lovely life in the suburbs, you know, and uh, then it's like, that's where that goes. And also, and, you know, in truth, you know, if I was to do that properly, it's also complex and difficult. The yep. truth is actually a lot more difficult. And, you know, in, in truth, my, my mum will tell you, like, the, yep. the stuff that's in Boy Swallows Universe is like 5% of what that woman endured, you know, yeah, and... um. Real darkness. Oh, mate, there's shit there that I don't think people could swallow, could yeah. could take. Yeah, they they'd have to put the book down and and uh, but but the fictional approaching all that stuff from some sort of place of truth, like a from a kernel of truth, yeah. and turning it into something magical just helped um, me to take the story to places that the truth didn't take it. So it's like, what what what's my intention here? It's not to. I just certainly wasn't to make people. Um, you know, depressed about, about, uh, working class life in Australia. Like I wanted, I wanted to do something that really, that brought the message of as cheesy as yeah. it sounds. Um, you can get through this shit if you hold on to love, like that's as simple as that. Like if you hold on to those five people in your world that are going through it too. And if you can still come together, that's why I like this whole group hug, the TV show's done it amazingly. This whole group hug, Comp yeah. this thing this family keeps doing through all this crap you know the mum gets out of prison group hug the mum gets out of a detox group hug like it's like that's so powerful it's like yeah because then you will get to 20 and you will get to to write the story the way you want it you know and um and that's sort of what i was trying to get at but the only way to do that and that helped also just just to like just the practicalities it's like these yeah these people just don't want their names, you know, written about. And this, you know, it was tough enough, mate, like for my, um, you know, like this, this mum of mine is just amazing, Gary. Like she, she had to go, she was, you know, by the time the universe comes out, like she's all good. Like that, that period was just a blip on the radar of a completely wondrous life. That's just full of everything. And there was yeah. so serious downs like that in the mid eighties, you know, that's a go. So my mom has to go to a boss. She works for an insurance company. She's retired now, but she was working for this, for this insurance company. She has to go into the the boss's office and go like, ah, sorry to bother you. But, uh, so I've got these four sons and the youngest one is this journo oh, and uh, he's written this book. Yeah. Oh, you imagine. And she's yeah. like, I don't think it'll go anywhere. Um, but just in case it does, he, it, it kind of was inspired. Inspired by the 1980s where I was in love with this really successful heroin dealer. It was a pretty wild time, but don't worry, the book's not going to go anywhere. And uh, just let you know, okay? And, and and might I say that workplace was amazing to mum. Like they are the biggest fans of Boy Swallows Universe. And they're, and and that book only adds to their kind of um, appreciation for her, you know? And it's sort of like, this is the yeah. cool thing. It's going to go one way. You think they're going to... You think they're going to react in a certain way, but people are amazing in truth. You know, most people are just incredible. And it, they go, hey. That... It, it does make a lot of sense what you, you said there, that it's so dark if you took people in a factual way. They, they shut yeah. from it. And you've got, to, you've got to find that light in the darkness. You really do that yin-yang thing. You, if, it, if it's too dark, people will just switch off. And I, I think you can get a, a more powerful story by fictionalizing it so people can sort of weave through it and it doesn't confront too much and then uh, see there's some light that uh, that comes out of the darkness is that uh, oh, mate. with the, the the way or what you hope the book would achieve oh mate i i actually say it even more explicitly in my my latest book uh it, there's it's this 
it's all about art. This a little bit about art and this thing. And the kid yeah. draws and it's this book Lola in the mirror. And the, anyway, I won't, I won't, but I, I you know, talk yeah, about we'll, it. But we'll uh, be talking about. Yeah. Oh, great, great, yeah. But uh, but but in there, she says it explicitly. Uh, and she's talking about drawing with 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 a with a pen, right? Like black drawing with a black ink, drawing with black ink. You cannot you cannot draw light on on a page. You cannot actually physically draw light. You can't draw brightness. The only way you make things light on on a sketch page is by enhancing the darkness. And, and that's, that's just yeah. a message for life, mate. Like that's like, and that's what what I was trying to do with Boy Swallows Universe. It's um, it's the hope and the light and the love just is all that bit stronger when you take the reader through that dark stuff with you. And and what you are actually trying to say is, I have so much of that stuff in me, and I've got I've carried that stuff. I wrote that book at thirty eight, and you know I really did. To the point, Gary, I friggin' like when I was at, at school and stuff, I'd sort of I'd I'd tell bullshit about where my mum was when when trying to explain why she wasn't at tuck shop and stuff. And I just get so ashamed of that. It's like, why didn't I say, no, nah, she's doing her time and she's gonna come out and she's gonna be this amazing grandma to my kids and my daughters are just gonna worship her because they're 16 and 14 now and they know that they've got her blood in their veins as well and, and that they can survive. Sorry, I'll, I'll get emotional if I go there on that. But like, they can survive anything, you know, because they know they they've seen what grandma did, you know. And it's like, so that's just ongoing light, you know, just ongoing hope and light that comes from yeah, seemingly dark stuff. Yeah, yeah. But of course, you don't know you don't know that you don't. This is the thing, mate. This is the thing. These fifteen-year-olds, these fourteen-year-olds, twelve-year-olds, they they don't know it, man. They don't. It's like it's so hard to convince them. That the light is coming and that, that that it is there for them if they can just sort of swim through the bloody dark stuff for as long as they can. Yeah. Well, bad things are going to happen if uh, if people don't have hope. And uh, just yeah. that little yeah. passage there you said, and I, I think that sort of brings – this is what I try to do on the podcast so people understand this world of crime and that, how it impacts mm. in so many ways. Just that little comment there that uh, I had to make excuses for my mum why she wasn't turning up at canteen duty. Like yeah. when, when you're talking about we're going to – crack down on this crime and we're going to sentence and truth in sentencing that type of thing no one's thinking about those things the impact that it has on the uh, people around the people oh. that have been taken away and how easy it is and it was a definite period where i was i think all my brothers we we went through it a bit where it's like you know what yeah no one really does give a shit about me so what what you know i just think about that kid who's going through that and then you go well yeah it it's an understandable process for that kid then to go well you know what i'm and I don't have a lot of money. I don't have much going for me. And here's all I know. So why don't I just go steal that car? You know, I don't know. And it's just, that's a simplified version, but it's like, I get that. I get that. I, I, I get it too. I get it too. Now, Trent, we might take a break here, but uh, we've obviously got plenty more to talk about when we get back for uh, part two. I'd like to Brilliant. talk to you about your new book, Lola in the Mirror, which like Boy Swallows Universe delves into some uh, dark areas. And mm. also keeping with the balance of darkness uh, with the light, I'd also like to talk about love. Now, I had prepared these <laughs> notes before you've even raised love, and we don't get to talk about love very often on I Catch Killers, but that's what we're going to talk about uh, when we get back. So we'll take a, a short break if that's okay. Thanks, Gary. Cheers. 